Have you ever wanted to see what it would look like if Kylo Ren retired from ruling the galaxy and became a middle-aged dad during an airborne toxic event? This is your movie. This is 2022's White Noise. Warning, spoilers ahead. We open up to a compilation of car crashes, and Murray tells his class that car crashes are a part of American tradition in film. Well, he's not wrong. When's the last time you watched an action movie that didn't have a car crash? If it's been a while, this movie gives you enough in the first minute to last a year. Murray tries to tell his class that you have to look past the violence of a car crash to see the optimism of it. Then we cut to traffic as people move through a small town to get to the college. Freshmen are saying goodbye to their parents, and they're getting embarrassing moments that will scar them for a lifetime. Jack watches as everyone bustles around, and he hangs up his robe to go home. At home, he tells Babette that she missed the day of station wagons, and she's genuinely disappointed. You've reached a whole new level of content when the event of the year is watching the station wagons line up on the first day of college. Anything must be a joy at that point. They head into the kitchen where their children are chiming in on several different conversations. Denise, Heinrich, Steffi, and Wilder are going about their own business, and the family seems functional at best. Denise notices Babette throwing away a medication bottle, and she pulls it out to find that it's Dylar. Just a heads up, if you want to enjoy the rest of the movie without knowing everything, don't look up Dylar. Don't make the same mistake I did. We're still going to get through this, though. I'll act surprised. That night, Jack enjoys some intimate time with Babette as she reads a novel to him, and she tells him that she would want to die before he does. And good night. This is prime pillow talking. Talk to your partner like this tonight and watch them freak out. The next day, Jack goes to work at the college as he teaches about Hitler, and Babette teaches whatever kind of class this is. I, I honestly don't know. Some sort of stretching every muscle in your body? At night, the family gathers to enjoy some quality time, and Jack sits through a terribly confusing German lesson. He feels embarrassed that he's one of the biggest Nazi professors, but he doesn't know any German himself. Later at the grocery store, Jack and Babette run into Murray, and he praises Jack for teaching about Hitler. A little later, Steffi spills the beans that Babette is using a prescription drug, and Jack decides to ask her about it later on. As they walk home, he tries to give her a chance to tell him about the pills, but she just tells him that she can't remember anything. Later on, Denise watches Babette leave the house again, and she goes to Jack to ask him what they're going to do about Babette taking medications. She tells him that Dylar isn't in her medical journal, and he tries to blow this off as if nothing's wrong. Denise is gonna grow up to work at the FBI, well, she might have a case now because Babette isn't in bed that night when Jack wakes up. Oh wait, she's in the window. I'm trying to take a break from horror movies. Actually, that's not Babette. False alarm. The figure gets up and walks into the bathroom. Whoever this intruder is is super ballsy, chilling in the bedroom, using his bathroom, and sitting on the bed. Yeah, no thank you. Jack ends up terrifying of the being as it yells at him, but when he checks the pillow next to him again, he finds Babette sleeping. Maybe he needs some Dylar. The next day, the professors at college are eating together, and they talk about how humanity needs catastrophe. Jack turns to another professor to see if she can analyze a pill, and he tells her that he has to find it first. Meanwhile, a drunk driver is hauling dangerous chemicals, and this can only end well. Back at the college, Jack and Murray are comparing Elvis to Hitler. They do such a good job that I'm starting to believe them. As Jack finishes up his speech, that drunk driver decides to T-bone a train that's carrying oil. Oil mixes with fire which hits a tank of toxic gas, and you get the beginning of the end, people. Later that evening, Jack takes his trash out to the road, and he watches the nearby neighbors go about their happy, mundane lives. He hears sirens in the distance, and Heinrich is outside the second-story window. Jack goes up to see what Heinrich is looking at, and he finds out about the tanker that blew up. Jack simply tells him that whatever it is probably won't come this way. Jack is literally the perfect example of someone in absolute denial. His kids and Babette are literally telling him all of these signs that point to the black billowing cloud affecting them, but Jack just wants his chili fried chicken. Can't blame him, that looks delicious. Okay, now I'm gonna go take a break to eat, I'll be back. Alright, so the whole family sits down to eat, and everything seems calm for a moment. Just for a moment. Denise eventually runs to the bathroom to throw up, and the sirens speed by outside. Suddenly, it sounds like Siren Head is approaching the neighborhood, and Heinrich rushes outside to see the neighbors take out their own trash to evacuate. Is it time to leave? Not according to Jack. Everyone rushes through the house to pack up everything that they can, and Jack tries to pack up his dinner. When they finally make it to the car, Steffi notices that all of the neighbors are gone, and they head out. Apparently, it's a requirement when evacuating to run over your trash. If you miss it the first time, take time to go back and hit it. As they drive down the road, they listen to a broadcast about an evacuation camp, and Jack is happy to hear that they have a plan. Just then, their quick escape comes to a screeching halt as they hit traffic on the interstate. 
and the kids start people watching other people in nearby cars. Suddenly, the radio tells them that they need to get indoors, and they're really confused because it told them to leave their house not long ago. Then, chaos erupts as people start crashing on the highway, but Jack becomes preoccupied by Babette when he notices her swallowing another pill. She waves it off and tells him to keep driving, but they're about to run out of gas, because a tragic event isn't complete without a gas shortage. At least he's able to find gas. If this movie was set nowadays, it would have been gone last week. 79 cents a gallon, too. I've never seen gas that cheap. While Jack pumps gas, we can see a black cloud coming over the gas station, and it's thick enough to even stop the rain. Once he finishes pumping gas, they jump back on the road, and Jack seems to understand just how serious this is as they get closer to the toxic cloud that's illuminating the sky. Everyone on the highway hops out of their car to look at the event. This is almost as bad as it would be nowadays. Everyone would be out in the toxic rain taking video footage with their cell phones. This is why people think humanity couldn't survive as a whole. Eventually, they make it to the camp, and now it looks like Jason is going to get them. Toxic cloud or nightmare killer? Take your pick. The family settles in at the camp, and everyone seems to collect their own gatherers. Babette reads the tabloids to people, Heinrich seems to be informing people about the toxin that they're running from, and the others are laying down. Eventually, a woman tells the crowd that anyone who's been exposed for more than 10 seconds should be evaluated. And Denise reminds Jack that he was outside for two and a half minutes when he was pumping gas. Jack heads over to the analyst, and the computer tells him that Jack is going to die. Huh. He doesn't know when or how, but he says anywhere within the next 15 to 30 years. Wow, I don't think they needed a toxin to make that happen. He even says that he'll be in his 70s in 15 years, so he'd be almost 90 in 30 years. I think he'll be okay. After hearing this news, Jack heads outside and he runs into Murray. Jack tells him the grim news, and Murray thinks that the computer might have made a mistake. Then, for some reason, Murray gives him a little gun, and he starts telling him about how thrilling it would be to kill death. Are we sure Murray wasn't exposed to the cloud? I think he's smoking something else. That night, everyone lays down to sleep, and Babette takes another pill. The instructions on these are one every three days. The cloud might not have gotten her, but she's about to overdose. Suddenly, Jack is woken up by Denise as everyone starts to panic. The cloud is on its way, and the campground is literal pandemonium. They can't leave yet. Jack goes on a heroic suicide mission to rescue Steffi's bun-bun, and this is the most exhilarating part of the movie so far. It gets better, though. The creepy dude that was sitting in Jack's bedroom that one night gives it to him. As they leave the camp, they decide to follow the gun-toting rednecks because Jack thinks that if anyone knows how to survive disaster, it's them. He ends up driving into a creek, and the car starts floating downstream. Eventually, they end up floating to a shallower part of the creek, and Jack starts the car back up. He floors the gas pedal, and they end up merging into traffic after driving through a cornfield. Eventually, they get to another shelter, and the guy in charge tells everyone that they can't leave the building. That night, Babette opens up about how the more scientific news she hears, the more worried she gets. Join the club. We live in a time of information, and everyone's scared. And within nine days, everyone goes back home like nothing happened. Just like that. Sound familiar? Jack and Murray walk through the grocery store, and Jack opens up about how Babette is different since the event. Murray tells Jack about a co-worker that died, and all Jack can think about is how fat the guy was. Apparently, some people think fat people live longer. This was a different time. When they get to the cashier, Jack thinks that he sees the mysterious figure at the doors, and he starts to wonder if death is just sound. Then, the guy bumps into his cart while wearing short shorts. Maybe the hallucinations from the toxic stuff really are a nightmare. Better yet, he imagines the fat co-worker surfing. Is there a secret desire he wants to fulfill? The next day, Jack goes to the doctor, and after getting called out for lying to him, the doctor sends him to another facility to get testing done. Jack asks him if he knows anything about Dylar, but the doctor's never heard of it. Oh no, is Dylar even more crucial to the story than we thought? Sorry, I forgot that I'm supposed to act surprised. Don't look it up still. Later, Jack makes it home after going for extra testing, and the family gets ready for dinner. Soon Babette comes downstairs, and she gives the kids a list of new warnings before leaving for a new class that she has to teach. Babette is acting stranger than normal, and Denise notices it. She takes Jack to the bedroom to show him that she found Babette's secret stash, and he takes one as proof. He calls the doctor to ask about the drug. He's never heard of it. He takes it to the neurochemistry professor to have it analyzed. She's never heard of it. This sounds like some sort of limitless drug. Or qualudes? That night, Jack confronts Babette, and she tells him that she answered an ad for a research drug. Apparently, the side effects were all over the place like real drugs, like those prescriptions for gas that they say could lead to death. Is your gas really that bad? The scientists tried to shut down the project, but Babette didn't accept this. She made a private arrangement with the head scientist where she gave up her body in exchange for more pills. 
This is the first time that Jack and Babette break their calm, solace routine, and it's kind of throwing me off. Why do I feel like the guy is someone we've already met? Where was Murray on the nights that this happened? Babette says that the arrangement is over because the drug didn't work, and Jack starts to wonder if she should even be there anymore. Eventually, he sits on the bed next to Babette, and he puts his hand on her leg to comfort her. There, there. Really, what else is he going to do at this point? Oh, I spoke too soon. They almost get it on, but Jack pulls away. Jack asks her what the pills were for, and she admits that they were to cure her of her fear of death. While we're at it, let's just drop all the drama bombs. Jack tells her about how he's infected with the toxin, and now it's all out in the air. That night, Jack goes to take one of the Dilar pills since he's starting to fear his own death, but they're gone. He checks in Denise's room, but she makes him tell her what it is before telling him that she threw the last tablets in the garbage compactor. Jack eventually finds the ad that Babette answered in the first place, and he grabs the gun Murray gave him before going to meet Mr. Gray. Mr. Gray tells him which motel to meet him at, and Jack attends the Hitler conference before his meeting. It's amazing how Jack and Babette are actually still talking to each other like nothing happened. I couldn't even be in the same room with her at this point. How much do you want to bet he's going to get jealous and shoot Mr. Gray? It's the creeper that's been popping up around town. Mr. Gray tells Jack that Dylar didn't work with the test subjects, and he moves on to talk about Babette as though it was a long time ago. Jack starts to hallucinate all the things that Babette must have done with Mr. Gray, and he decides to play a cruel trick on him. Jack starts playing with his mind, but he eventually pulls the gun on him. Jack's at least kind enough to let Mr. Gray take a crap before killing him. That's just common courtesy. He plants the gun in Mr. Gray's hand after cleaning it, but he doesn't make sure Mr. Gray is dead. Rookie mistake. Babette even pops up as Mr. Gray shoots. The story gets weirder. They decide to help Mr. Gray. He technically dies after Jack gives him mouth-to-mouth. -mouth. Then they convince him that he shot himself. Then they drop him off at the ER that looks like a Vegas chapel. That pretty much sums it up. While they're taken care of by the nuns, they find out that the nun doesn't actually believe in heaven, and their entire belief system falls apart. It doesn't help that the nun says all of this in German, so she just sounds so angry. She might have scared some faith into them, though. Suddenly, the sun shines on them, and they feel like everything is alright with the world. The next day, everything goes back to normal, but Babette will be walking with a limp for some time since she got shot. The family goes about their normal routine, but Jack and Babette seem to have a newfound respect for their unknown lives. They all head to the grocery store, and this is apparently a musical number now. Everyone's moving in sync to unheard music, and the credits roll. This was a weird one. Was this about an odd family? Was this about a deadly toxic event? A sexual research drug dealer? All of the above, and somehow it still worked. Give it a shot. Thank you for watching, and I hope you enjoyed the video. Don't forget to like and subscribe for more like this one. Comment what you think I should watch next, and I'll see you in the next video.